Hello, this is Josh Patel, and today we're going to be doing Chapter 6 in Biology, which is all about meiosis and Mendel. Right now we're going to do 6.1, which is chromosomes and meiosis. A key concept is gametes have half the number of chromosomes that body cells have. So we know there are two types of cells. We have body cells, and then we have gametes. So body cells are all the cells in our body besides gametes. And gametes are sex cells. So body cells are everything but sex cells. So you have body cells and gametes. Body cells are also called somatic cells. Germ cells, cells that give directions for cells to develop into gametes. Germ cells are located in the ovaries and testicles. So germ cells is related to sex, um, sex cells. Gametes are sex cells, example, egg and sperm. They're the only two sex cells mammals have. Gametes carry 23 chromosomes of DNA, and our body cells carry twice as much, so it would be 46. So basically, in this lesson, we're going to be comparing and co contrasting body cells and sex cells. So gametes carry 23 chromosomes, which is half the number of chromosomes body cells have. So... Your cells have autosomes and sex chromosomes. Your body cells have 23 pairs of chromosomes. So it says 23 pairs, so that means that we actually have 46. Homologous pairs of chromosomes have the same structure. So homo is same, so it indicates that they have the same structure. For each homologous pair, one chromosome comes from each parent. So it's basically saying that you have two parent cells and they come to form one, that's a homologous pair. Chromosome pairs 1 through 22 are autosomes. And our last one, which is the 23rd pair, is the sex chromosome. So autosomes are everything but the sex chromosome. Autosomes are defined as any chromosome that is not a sex chromosome, see it says it right there, appeared in pairs in body cells but as single chromosomes in spermatozoa. Sex chromosomes X and Y determine gender in mammals. So X and Y is just chromosome 23, and it determines, like, whichever pair you have, it determines what you are. So XX would be female, while XY would be a male. So body cells are diploids, and gametes are haploids. So since we know gametes have... 23 chromosomes, which is half as much as a diploid, we can tell that gametes, gametes are haploids, and diploids would be a body cell, because dip is two, and a body cell has twice as much, while gametes have half, half as much, which would be haploid. Fertilization between egg and sperm occurs in sexual reproduction. So diploid cells have two copies of every chromosome, which we already know that. Body cells are diploids, okay? Half the chromosomes come from each parent. So you have two parents, and they give a certain amount, and then they add up to become a diploid or a full set. Mom can only give an X, since women are XX, and dads can only give, they can give either X or Y. And so determining on what you get, well, since you can only get an X from your mom, and determining what your dad gives you, you're either male or female. So here it says body cells are diploid, and as we see, there are four different chromosomes, and there's two pairs, like the small one pairs up and the big ones pair up. So we have a full set right there. Haploid cells have half, basically, one copy for every chromosome, and gametes are haploids. Gametes have 22 autosomes and one sex chromosome. So if you add those up, you get 23. And this is a gamete, and as we see, there's only one big one, one small one which means it has half as much as a body cell here. So chromosome numbers must be maintained in animals. Many plants have more than two copies of each chromosome. So humans have 23, but different animals and different plants could have more than 23 or less than 23. Mitosis and meiosis are types of nuclear division that make different types of cells, and we already learned this. Mitosis is what would be asexual reproduction, while meiosis is sexual. 
mitosis makes more diploid cells, so it makes a full body cell, basically, that's what it's saying. As we see here, the two resultant cells look exactly like the body cell we looked at in the last slide. Meiosis makes haploid cells from diploid cells, so meiosis we know is sexual reproduction, so it produces like sperm or it produces eggs, which are sexual, and we get half the amount of chromosomes in these. So meiosis produces gametes, as we just said, and this is the chart of meiosis, and if we look at the bottom most cells, we see that they look exactly like the gamete cell we saw in the earlier slide, and we can tell they have half as much ca causing them to be a haploid cell. Now we're in 6.2, which is process of meiosis. A key concept is during meiosis, diploid cells undergo two cell divisions that result in haploid cells. And this is basically what it's saying in this picture here. It's going through two separate divisions to become a haploid. So cells go through two rounds of division in meiosis. Meiosis reduces chromosome numbers and creates genetic diversity. So genetic diversity is what allows every animal to be different from any other animal in its species. Basically meaning the difference between me and you and you and another peer. We're all different. And this is caused by meiosis and genetic diversity. So here, it's just another chart again. And the bottom, the gametes, they form like two parent cells, which would be two gametes, they form together to produce a genetically new, a very diverse animal. It's not exactly the same as the parent, but it has similar genes, but it's different. So that causes genetic diversity. Meiosis one and meiosis two have four phases similar to those in mitosis. So now we're gonna go into each phase of meiosis, and there's two phases. So pairs of homologous chromosomes separate in meiosis one. Homologous chromosomes are similar, but not identical. So they're kind of similar, but not exactly the same. Sister chromatids divide in meiosis 2, and we'll get to that a little later. Sister chromatids are copies of the same chromosome. So this is a diagram showing what is what. Homologous chromosome are the two whole X's together, and sister chromatids is just half of an X. <coughs> so meiosis 1 occurs after DNA has been replica replicated. So now we have two sets of DNA, and we can split it and get the same cell again. Meiosis 1 div divides homologous chromosomes into four phases. So this is a chart of meiosis 1. And in the first pro pro prophase, we, all we see happening is the, mem the nuclear membrane like dissolves, and we have chromatids that start to form. And then the second stage, which is metaphase, spindle fibers align the homologous chromosomes along the equator of the cell. And then in anaphase, they pull the chromosomes apart. And as we see here, we have the whole X, the whole chromosome, not a sister chromosome. And so in telophase, the spindle fibers begin to dissolve and the nuclear membrane reforms. So the main difference between meiosis 1 and meiosis 2, which we'll see on the next page, is that in this one, we have a full chromosome, a homologous chromosome, while in meiosis 2, we're dividing sister chromatids. And as we see, we have two resultant cells here, both with a full set of DNA. So now meiosis 2 divides sister chromatids in four phases. DNA is not replicated between meiosis 1 and meiosis 2. But in the first one, it was, so we have the same cell again. But now, we're not going to duplicate our DNA, so we're just going to have what we ended up with in meiosis 1. So we take our resultant from meiosis 1, and it goes through the same phases again. So it goes through prophase, which basically just dissolves part of the nuclear envelope. And then it goes to metaphase, where everything aligns in the middle, and the spindle fibers attach to the sister chromatids this time, not the homologous chromatids. And then in anaphase, we split the sister chromatids apart, and we now have half a sister chromatid. And in telophase, the nuclear envelope realigns and it reforms around our new DNA. And so now these four resultant cells are gametes, because they only have half the DNA they should have. <coughs> 
Meiosis differs from mitosis in significant ways. Meiosis has two cell divisions while mitosis has one. So we just looked at meiosis, which is sexual reproduction, and mitosis is what body cells go through. In mitosis, homologous chromosomes never pair up. Meiosis results in haploid cells, while mitosis results in diploid cells. So since mitosis happens in body cells, we end up with diploids just like a body cell. But in meiosis, we're doing, we have to do with sex cells, and since sex cells have half the DNA, we end up with haploids. So this is comparing mitosis and meiosis. As we see on the right, meiosis goes through two separations while mitosis goes through one. And as we see in the end, in mitosis, we have basically the same cell, but in meiosis, we split it up one more time and we end up with gametes. Haploid cells develop into mature gametes. <clears throat> we don't really need to know this page as much, so I'll just skip over it. So now we're in 6.3, which is Mendel and heredity. So Mendel's research showed that traits are inherited as discrete units. Mendel is, was a scientist that basically did a bunch of tests on pea plants to discover how our genes work, and he laid the foundation. So Mendel laid the groundwork for genetics. Traits are distinguished characteristics that are inherited. So he's basically saying that we, all our traits we have, we inherited it from our parents. Genetics is the study of biological inheritance pattern and variation. And Mendel showed that traits are inherited as discrete units. So he's basically saying that traits are separate. Like your parents have a bunch of separate traits and they give you parts of it. So your mom would give you a like a certain trait of your hair and your dad gives you a certain trait of your hair and whichever one's dominant, that's the one you get. So it's saying you don't get like a full set, it comes in individual pieces. Many in Mendel's day thought traits were blended, so he basically proved them wrong or he was contradicted to what they believe. Mendel's data re revealed patterns of inheritance. So Mendel made three key decisions in his experiment. So he decided what he would do. One, he used purebred the use of purebred plants. So purebred plants would be any animal or plant that has dominant, both dominant or both recessive genes. So if it has, in science, they use a capital letter as dominant and lowercase letter as recessive. And since you have one from your parent, one from your mom, you'll have two letters. So let's use P as an example. If you have two capital P's, you're a purebred. If you have two lowercase P's, you're a purebred. So control over breeding. He controls which, plant, which plants breeded and which ones didn't. And observation of seven either or traits. So he just discovered, well, he used certain traits on these plants. So see, as we can see to the picture, he used pea plants in most of his experiments. So Mendel used pollination to fertilize selected pea plants. Pea generation crossed to produce F1 generation. So pea was the first generation of plants he used, and he produced the second generation, which was F1. And this is going to be a little confusing in words, but there's a nice chart at the end which will explain it all. So interrupted the self-pollinization process by removing male flower parts. So basically he cut off the male flower parts and used it to pollinate whichever females he wanted to pollinate. Mandela allowed the resulting pl plants to self-pollinate. So in for this type of pollination where you choose, this was in generation P, capital P, and then the next generation, which was F1, he allowed them to pollinate themselves. And F1 plants are all heterozygous, meaning that they none of them were purebred. So among the F2 generations, which came from F1, some plants had purple flowers while some had white. So he's actually using flowers, not peas this time. So as we see in the first column, we have generation P. We have a purple and a white. And then they produced F1. So the purple and the white were both purebred. 
Um, they produced the F1 generation, which had two purple plants, which then produced F2, which produced purple and white plants. And this was strange, because how do you go from two purples to a white if he thought purple was dominant? Because the purple and the white produce just purples. So this we will discover how it works in 6.5, so you'll have to watch the next video. Mendel observed patterns in first and second generations of his crosses. So this is just the data he found. Mendel drew three important conclusions from the data he found. Traits are inherited as discrete, discrete units, so one trait is different from another trait. You won't get like web feet and web hands together. They're two separate things. You either have web, web feet or you either have web hands, which is an example. Organisms inherit two copies of each gene, one from each parent. So, as pure birds, I said, have either both a capital P or both a lowercase p. It's basically saying you get one P from your parent, one, one P from your mom, and one P from your dad. And depending on which ones you get, that determines the outcome. The two copies segregated during gamete formation. And the last two conclusions are called law of segregation, which we will learn about later. And so this is where we're going to stop chapter 6. We're just going to do the half of it today, and next we will go to the other half. So make sure to watch chapter 6, part 2.